Thursday. I've got it. Six fifty five. Yes, we are. We'll start at slide ten. <clears throat> Maybe. Hmm. Oh. It should say New Testament biblical emphasis of spiritual gifts. <clears throat> mm. Mm -hmm. She doing right there, man. She doing right there. She doing right there. That ain't where you supposed to be. Get your butt over there. Sitting down talking, this you don't talk up here, you walk up here. Over there. Oh. Oh, no. But, but, uh, um, you see them wires right there? Why don't you come on up another pew? Um, live wires like bald heads. Jesus. Mm -hmm. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, oh, thank you, keep singing, Lord, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Lord, oh, I just want to thank you, Lord. Well, you've been yeah, yeah. so been anybody's friend yeah yeah when everybody else walked off and left me you've been
you've been my friend. I just want to thank you, Lord. Let us pray. All gracious, wise, eternal God, thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see another day. So, God, and by it penetrating in our hearts, we know we will, we will change and we'll see the outcome in our life. But not only will we see the outcome in our life, but we'll be sure to give you all the honor and glory and praise. Bless the ones who are online virtually, oh God, who cannot make it. Or choose not to come in the building, oh God, and pray that they're not distracted by the things that are around them, wherever they may be. Oh God, we pray and ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Before we um, get to our study tonight, I um, just wanted to um, share it with you all that we just received word that Mother Pearl has gone on to be with the Lord. Um, moments ago, uh, I was able to see her this morning and see her last week. I shared with you all, but... Um, There's no question about, <laughs> I want you all to know that Mother Pearl left here on her terms because they thought she was going to be gone last night. And here we are, almost seven o'clock today. Um, we will certainly miss her. But she's not lost. She's not lost, Joe. And so um, I want I want y'all to do something for me before we can we just celebrate her life now? Can we just give God praise for her life now? <laughs> Hallelujah. If it is true that her soul has left her body and is on its way to the presence of God. I want her to hear from us now and not later that we are grateful and thankful for her presence and her service in this place. It would not be what it is if it wasn't for her mother, mother Pearl, amen. And so we, we are certainly going to be supporting them in any way, shape, form, or fashion um, that that we can. All right, I'm gonna push a little bit. I'm We've been talking about understanding spiritual giftedness, its purpose and its power, and we will continue that on tonight. Um, we greet those of you who are joining us virtually tonight. We're grateful for your presence and the hearty thanks to our Diakonos ministry for us, leading us in our opening prayer and devotion. We have covered a lot of ground as it relates to deepening our relationship with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. We've come to understand that our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit is predicated on our ability and or our willingness to receive and or yield to the Holy Spirit. And we do so that we might be influenced by the Holy Spirit and that everything that we attempt to do for God 
we are to do it under or with the influence of the Holy Spirit. So we started talking about spiritual giftedness, and I want to begin tonight not recapping the lesson, but going back, or the previous lesson, but going back to your handout where it talks about the New Testament biblical emphasis of spiritual gifts. <clears throat> and for those of you who haven't been with us from the, from the inception of this series, please go out to our YouTube page and look at, I think that's right, the Zoom. Is that right, Giza? The, and you can see the lessons in their entirety. So New Testament biblical emphasis of spiritual gifts. I am in the portion of this series where I'm simply setting the subject matter for you before we started trudging through the biblical passages. I'm talking about the subject of spiritual gifts from the context of the church as a whole and it's an advancement across space and time. Y'all with me? So the emphasis of spiritual gifts in the New Testament is not on something we possess. Neither is it on something that is given to us, but the emphasis of spiritual gifts are the work of the spirit through us. If you recall in our previous teachings, we said that the spirit comes to us and then the spirit gifts us in accordance with that which God has purposed for our lives or for our relationship with him. We have distinguished that there's a difference between spiritual gifts and what we often refer to as talents or abilities, all right? And so um, what I want you to note right now is that we can't define ourselves by our spiritual gift, right? There are some faiths and some denominations that will tell you that is the definition of, of, of a Christian and is confirmed in the, in the gift you have. But the gift is not about something we possess, right? It, it's about more of a, and I'll get to this in a minute, uh, it's about more of being, uh, having a giftedness. We can move, Kadisha. So the Holy Spirit, I said to you, was the ultimate gift and giver. Y'all just track with me, and I'll put this together for us in a minute. But the Holy Spirit is the ultimate gift and the giver. So spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, right? And this implies that the Spirit is the ultimate gift. Here's what I want you to hone in. The gift clothes us. Say clothes us, Right? with gifts to reveal the spirit of God in the world. Now, here's, here's what I want you to note. I told you this last week that spiritual gifts, when we talk about spiritual gifts, what we need to think about is that we are spiritually gifted. We have a giftedness, right? Not a gift that we possess, but there is an enabling that comes to us, right? As a result of being a recipient of a gift of the spirit. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Okay. Um, the easiest way for me to articulate it, 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 one way for me to articulate it is you get, you get wet with water. Making sense? And you can't separate two. So when you're spiritually gifted or you receive a gift or the Bible says we've been gifted, what it's telling you is that there is a giftedness to you as a result of that gift. And I want you to think more about being, having a giftedness as opposed to having a gift. Am I making sense? The reason I want you to do that is because um, the gift is never really about you. It's, all, it's always about God and what God is doing, what I reference as the Missio Dei, right? Uh, let's keep moving, Kanisha. Um, spiritual gifts, I told you last week, are, are, are tied to the Holy Spirit's purpose. And the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit is tied to the mission of the Spirit. Say the mission of the Spirit. So the mission of God is being executed in our day as the mission of the Spirit. 
And so when God comes to us in the person of the Holy Spirit, he brings to us gifts that are effective in the mission of the Spirit. Does that make sense? So we don't have gifts for our own personal benefit, right? But it is that we are profitable. That by one, one passage talks about being profitable. That doesn't mean financially. That means that you are able to accomplish that which is ascribed to your life by God because he has equipped you with what you need to accomplish what he's purposed, all right? Um, so God, God's presence is made known through the giftedness, all right? And, and God's presence is made known to others as we operate in our giftedness. Am I making sense? All right, I, I want to do this. I want to go down to, we looked at Luke chapter four last week. And, um, uh, and so I want to talk about this statement in, this, in this, the last line on this particular slide. It says, the spirit's purpose is to endow and edify the church. I want you to say endow and edify. All right, so the word there, endow, is, is the word, really, it really means to be saturated, right? It means to be saturated. Um, and to edify, you've already learned, means to be built up. Are you with me? So the purpose of spiritual giftedness is that you be endowed and edified as a part of the spiritual house or what we call the church, right? Now we have a purpose. The mission of that endowment and that edification is to enable us to speak hope and bring liberation to the oppressed. We saw this in Jesus's teaching where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me too. And he runs the list of those things, right? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter four. We're going to do some work tonight. We're going to do some work. When we tend to hear about being gifted or spiritually gifted, we have this tendency to detach it from the work of the Holy Spirit. So as a result of that, what we do is we praise the gift, right? But miss out on the giftedness. Are you with me? We prioritize in the church, we, we are spiritually gifted and this is my gift. But in reality, what we're missing is if it is really a spiritual gift, it is provided for you a giftedness. So there is an effectiveness to your life concerning the things of God. Am I making sense? Now, I raise that because it's hard for us to see it oftentimes in scripture because scripture is sometimes in confrontation with how we conceptualize things. We are a sensationalist type of being. What I mean by that is we like the phenomenon. We like the phenomenal, right? We are driven to the phenomenal. That's why we were out there looking all up at the sky the other day. Right? We went in awe and because of the fun. We, we, we're driven to that. And sometimes when we read scripture, what happens to us is we gravitate to the notion of that type of phenomena and we miss the truth. So I'm going to show you something here. Chapter four of Luke. You there? Luke chapter four. Those of you at home, turn in your Bible to Luke chapter four. All right. I'm going to begin at verse one. I'm going to read verses one and two, and then I'm going to ask you a question. All right. It says, and Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. My question to you is, in this passage, where do we find Jesus? In the wilderness. That's where he is. Are you sure? He is returning from Jordan. We see Jesus returning from Jordan, right? Who's in front of him? Who's in front of him? The Holy Spirit's in front of him? The Holy Spirit was with him. 
Right. So the Holy Spirit wasn't in front of him. You see, that in front of him response was sensationalism. You see, we pictured it that way. Right? But you caught yourself very good. Give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. You, no, seriously, give yourself a hand. You did a good job. All right. Now, you caught yourself because, because what you discovered was that the spirit was within him. Or, or, or Craig said the spirit was with him. Right? Where geographically, we, we don't know, but we know he was with him. Now, watch the text. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, right? So how was that leading taking place? Was the spirit over here outside of Jesus going, come here, come here, come here, come here? No, how was it happening? Within him. So there is a sense of some kind of internal experience that Jesus is having, that Jesus has the capacity are you with me? He has the capacity to identify that he is being guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, th there's a hint in the passage because it says, are you all with me? In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. So the byproduct of being full of the Holy Ghost is that Jesus is now able to be led by the Holy Ghost. There's a sense of maturity in the relationship that Jesus has with the person of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of it, he is living out of the byproduct of that relationship. I.e., that's why I'm sharing with us how we deepen our relationship with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. It is not in rejection of anything we've learned. It is to enhance what we have learned as a result of it. Are y'all with me? We're in Luke 4, verse 1. You ready? So he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now watch this. The reason the Spirit within led him into the wilderness as he was coming out of what, Jordan, was to be tempted by the devil. The Holy Spirit will lead you into some testing. Testing that is essential to affirm your relationship with God. Are y'all understanding? He, he doesn't have anything in his hand. He hasn't sung a note. He hasn't preached a note. Because singing and preaching isn't his gift. He's being led by the Spirit. It's about the fulfillment of purpose. What's the purpose in the passage? The purpose in the passage is that God is getting ready to teach the devil a lesson. And the lesson is predicated on what his word is. Y'all are mighty quiet. Now, if we read the rest of the passage, you know what happens. There's all these testings that come, and as a result of it, watch this. Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost, is able to withstand the opposition of the adversary. And not only that, to impart to the adversary, watch this, what is accurately written. What is, what is precise as it relates to the will of God. Because that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, to bring all things back to our remembrance that pertain to life and godliness. So, so apart from a full experience of the Holy Spirit or a full sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about this stuff we talk about where we do all those other things and we have to tear it. No, I'm talking about being totally submitted to the spiritual influence of God such that when you live out your life in whatever condition or experience you're in, you're doing it with intel and inspiration that comes from God, not from any other source. See, that's what distinguishes the church from the world. I think I need to go a step further. It's also what distinguishes, don't miss this, the organization from the organism. Are you with me? Because when you are led by the Spirit, you are saying, I am submitted to the guidance of the Spirit, so therefore what the information I need is not the information that comes from the books. 
If I get it from a book, it should confirm what I receive from the spirit. It's also, are y'all with me? It's also significant because, because that's why spiritual disciplines, and I'm going to underscore, spiritual disciplines are significant. Because we are not full of the Holy Spirit because we are not committed to spiritual disciplines. So the disciplines cannot do in our lives what God has purposed them to do. So the resolve is we live depleted of the spirit. So we live depleted of spiritual information. We live depleted of spiritual intel. So that's why we have more questions than we do resolves. Are you understanding what I'm teaching? So what do I mean by spiritual disciplines? prayer. We only pray when in trouble. Study. We only study when we're looking for something. But if we pray, right, as Paul says in the spirit and in the understanding, right, as a result of that, we are building ourselves up. Uh-oh, what does that word mean? Come on. I'm being edified through the process of spiritual disciplines. Can I tell you the reason that you're not, you're not buffed like DJ is because you don't work out like DJ. I'm going to get him, y'all. I'm, 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 I'm drinking milk. <laughs> right? Y'all understand what I'm telling you? Right? Because, watch this. You should be built up in the spirit. But the way you do it is being spiritually disciplined in prayer, in the word of God. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration. What does that word mean? Ins inspiration. Inspiration. Spirit led. That's why when Jesus, I mean, when Satan comes to Jesus in Luke 4 and he's telling him all these things, they're deviated expressions of the word. He is able to tell him, get thee behind me. It's written. Am I making sense? This is the first time we see Jesus operating this way. You remember when they're on their way, right? They're, they're, him and the disciples are traveling and Jesus says, hold up, hold up, hold up. I must needs go to Samaria. Y'all remember that? Where, we in, where, where the woman at the well is, right? Samaria is a place that, watch this, that Jesus' type are not supposed to be there. And if he gets there, there's supposed to be conflict. So when he says, I got to go there, the disciples are looking at him and going, have you lost your mind? Y'all traveling with me, right? But he says, I must needs go. Who told him? It wasn't on an agenda. Are y'all understand what I'm teaching? Watch this. But there was a purpose. Because had he rejected the agenda given to him by the spirit that nobody else around him was able to get because they weren't sensitive to the spirit, we would not have the understanding of what real worship is. Are y'all understand? And how can we have a church, right, that doesn't know worship? We can't because that's what the church is purposed to do. So my question to you is how has our insensitivity or our lack of discipline spiritually led to our ignorance concerning who we're supposed to be in God? You don't have to answer the question. I want you to just think about it. Are y'all with me? Now, um, Khadija, I think I'm moving. The divine important? Yes. The divine importance of spiritual giftedness. You have to think, what is the divine importance of spiritual giftedness? Now, I'm, I'm going to give you some history. In, um, in 312, say 312, A.D., well, nobody there but Deacon Fowler. <laughs> All right? In 312 A.D., I want y'all to just stay with me. This is some history, church history. In 312 A.D., the Roman emperor was Constantine, right? And Constantine made Christianity the religion of the empire. 312 AD, y'all to keep that in your back pocket. And the church began to grow, but it grew, watch this, bureaucratically. Y'all with me? He appointed leaders in the church from the bureaucracy. Are you with me? A practice we continue today. 
Now, mind you, in that day, the dominant guide for the church was the spirit. This is after Jesus, don't, right? Has already told the disciples to go and wait until they endure with power. The church at Rome is established. Are y'all with me? And now the church is established and Constantine says, we're going to make Christianity the state religion. And I'm going to appoint leaders in the church of Jesus Christ from my bureaucracy. What was the problem with that? Beloved, the problem was this. They weren't spirit sensitive. Gifted people in the church, remember many times, here's the word, weeded out of leadership and replaced by the appointed ministers who were favored by the bureaucracy. Oh, y'all ain't. That sounds like the church. Come on, y'all. Let's just go and say amen. Shame the devil. It's, it's still happening today, right? Because what we do, watch this. We, we, we love democracy in the church. Truth, right? We do, right? Brother Pastor, I move. I second. All in favor, I. Most you care. We off running on an agenda. Nobody prayed. Nobody sought the Lord. Now, the reason that we exercise a democracy is because people don't get along unless they agree. Y'all are mighty quiet. And we all, y'all still with me? Stay with me. And we always yield to the majority because you're the majority, <laughs> right? You know, we don't necessarily keep the peace. We leave still mad, but we, we got to decide something. Y'all stay with me. I'm going to teach you. Stay with me, right? Now watch this. Here is the challenge with that. The challenge with that is oftentimes we end up with an agenda that's based in man, not in God. And the reason that we can't agree is because, watch this, number one, not all of us are standing in what God wants. Can I whisper something to you? You're not getting mad at me. Do you not know that the church is really not a democracy? It's a theocracy. There were already two, three people who voted. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In fact, they said, let us make man. They didn't even ask man if they want to be made. <laughs> let me move. Stay with me, y'all. Stay with me. Okay. All right. I'm, 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 let's turn the corner. Why am I sharing this with you? Because we have to, again, revive a sensitivity to the person of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the active agent of God at work in our day. And it is not in confrontation with who Jesus is. We got into the relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But what have we done since we've established the relationship? I'm going to keep teaching. We're going to get to some Bible here. Let's talk about the benefits of spiritual gift in this focus. Right? So one of the functions of the local church is to help believers understand who they are in Christ and y'all with me how to live the Christian life more fully how I many is that your goal for being a part of the church you're gonna say it is now anyway right <laughs> but that's the function of the local church you'll be you'll be amazed there's some churches that will argue with you when you start talking about what you need to do is, is to teach believers how to understand who they are in Christ. Okay, let me put it this way. That's why Sunday school exists. That's why Sunday school exists. That's why Bible study exists. That's why we come to worship. Central to the Christian life is an understanding of who we are in relationship to Jesus Christ. That's the number one priority for coming to church. 
Sir, we would see Jesus. Are y'all with me? Let's keep working. Focusing on spiritual gifts is another objective. No, go back. Of the church. What they are, who has them, how to discover one's giftedness, and how to use gifts most appropriately. Do we do that? We do now. That's what I'm doing with you right now. I'm having you focus on the person of the Holy Spirit. I'm having you focus on what it means to have, be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I'm having you focus on being spiritually influenced and functioning out of that spiritual influence that we might be about the work of God, not our own works. Are you with me? That's what I'm doing with you right now. Now watch this. If that happens, I'm going to say when that happens, it could ignite a movement of service and influence unlike anything we've experienced during our lifetime. How do I know? It happened in the scriptures. These are they who turned the world upside down when they didn't even have a Bible. They walked and influenced individuals, families, and nations being sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They didn't have time to argue about how many books of the Bible there were. They didn't have no books. Are you understanding? Are you, are you understanding? Okay. All right. All right. Let me, let me not get excited. Let me just stay, stay calm. I'm getting excited. All right. Let's keep, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. All right, before I, before I go any further, have I said anything to you? Is there anything, any questions you have in your heart right now before I move? Because I'm getting ready to go more into the biblical aspects of our teaching. I'm leaving this preamble, this, this, this setting the context for the lesson. Do you have any questions, um, anything arise in you before I move? Anybody? Any unresolved? Okay. All right. For those of you who weren't with us um, when we started the series, one of the things I taught concerning the scripture was that although the scripture is emphatically true, not everything in this, it is not exhaustive of God. It is in fact emphatically true of God, but it's not exhaustive of God. What I mean by that is Jesus makes a statement, or there's a statement made in the, in the end of one of the gospels that says, um, if there, there were many other things that Jesus did, but, the, but, but there's not a book big enough to contain. Right? So there are some things that Jesus did that, that, that are not recorded for us, but this canonized scripture gives us the principles of existence. And so as a result of that, this is enough for us to stand on and to live by. Are, are you with me? But we should never think that all that we read is all that there is. Because that diminishes who God is and what God can do in your life. That's why I told you that when we read in this book, we're going to read several lists of gifts right? But I'm going to categorize those gifts for you, for you to understand what God was doing when he revealed these gifts to us in scripture. Because what's most important is not the list of gifts. Because if you subscribe to only the list of gifts, you're going to, min you're going to minimize God. Are you with me? But the list of gifts serve to help us understand how God works in the areas of spiritual gifts. Y'all with me? Okay. All right. Let me know if there are any questions, Khadija. All right. All right. So let's talk about these, these, these three lists of gifts that we're going to talk about. There are motivational gifts. Say motivational gifts. I've got a question for the what do you think motivational gifts um, are purposed for? Very good. Motivation. Motivation. It's that simple, right? There are ministry gifts. What do you think they're purposed for? For ministry, for ministry, right? For ministry. Manifestation gifts, what are, what are they? What are they purpose for? Manifestation, what that mean? Y'all thought I wouldn't go ask, didn't you? What does it mean, manifest? To bring forth, to bring forth, to give birth to. Now watch this. So there are gifts that motivate gifts of ministry and gifts of manifestation. Are you with me? So the spirit comes to you 
The spirit works on you. The spirit works through you. So if the spirit comes to you and gifts you, the gift isn't for you. The gift is for ministry, watch this, and to produce something that comes from you. Are y'all understanding? Okay. I'm, I'm glad you do. We're going to look at this. So, 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 so let's talk about this first set of gifts. Um, go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We have, we have worn Romans 12 out, y'all. Um, but never exhausted it completely. Romans chapter 12. And, and verses... You should know verses one, one, two, and three by heart. But I want to pick up at verse three. Verses. Remember, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. And be not what? Conform to this world. Here we go. But be you what? Transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Why? that you may prove what is the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Verse three is where I want to concentrate. He says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. What does he mean thinking soberly? Not to think more highly of himself than he ought to. Put, I'll roll with that. Put it in context of the lesson. Measuring your value too high based on what? Okay, so he says every man has been dealt a measure of faith. Now, when we get over to identifying the spiritual gifts, you will find that faith is a spiritual gift. But it's a spiritual gift given to every man at the confessing of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because it takes faith to do what? To please God. Without faith, you can't please God. Now watch me, y'all. If it pleases God that every man would be saved, right? God then has to give every man what is needed in order to become saved so that he's pleased. He gives to every man faith. That's why there's not a person on the planet who does not have what they need to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But the only thing that stands in their way, don't miss it, is their reasoning or their will. Because their reasoning and their will is contrary to faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. But I, I can't believe in what I can't see. That's because you're reasoning. Y'all are mighty quiet. No, he's saying don't think so highly of yourself because he says this. You ought to think in line with the grace applied to your life. Now we're going to open that up. Are y'all still with me? Okay, so watch this. He says, for I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think. I want, I want you to hear this. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think. I'm going to say it again. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think. Which means there is a high thinking you should have. Uh-uh, stay with me, stay with me. There's a high thinking that you should have, but it ought not be higher than you ought. Are you with me? That requires that you have some understanding of how you should be thinking. Because if you don't know how to think or what to think about, you don't know when you hit the mark or when you don't. Y'all stay with me. Now, here's what he says. He says, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, 
So we being many are one body in Christ and every one member is one of another, right? Now here it is, verse six. Having then, what? Gifts. So, so the thinking is in context with the what? Gifts. Y'all are mighty quiet. But if I don't even know anything about any gifts, I'm probably going to think either more highly than I ought to or lower than I'm supposed to. I'm going to define myself or my relationship with God based on something else because I don't know what I need to know. And I won't know, don't miss me, y'all. I won't know my gifts until I develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, with God, the Holy Spirit. Am I making sense? Now, I may have religion all day long. Are y'all with me? I may have a practice of religion, but I will not show forth a relationship with God. That's why we got people who can come to church on Sunday and live any old kind of way afterward. Because they have a practice. Brushing your teeth is a practice, right? But if you're going to brush your teeth and then go eat cheeses all day, it ain't going to make a difference. Y'all understand what I'm showing you? Stay with me. So he says, watch this. He says to us that, that verse six again, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, having gifts differing according to the grace given us. Gifts, right? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to debate whether I really want to go into this Greek stuff or not. Okay, charismata is that word you're looking at, charismata, right? The other word that looks like ex exapen, that's not what it is, is charis, 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 right? One means grace, the other means gifts. Now watch this. We know grace to be unmerited favor. But we can have unmerited favor and not experience it because we don't know our gifts. We have gifts, they all differ, right? But our gifts differing is in accordance with the grace on our lives. So my favor is not your favor. Don't look at me like you don't understand that, right? Let me go ask your mama for what you ask your mama for, you're going to look at me like I'm crazy because you're going to want to know why your mama want to give to me what she, what you want her to give to you. And the only reason you feel that way is because you know the favor you have with your mama should not be the same favor I have with your mama. Don't act like I ain't in the house. I know I'm right. You be looking at me crazy, right? Why? Because we understand favor, and we also understand it in, 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 in correlation with giftedness, just not spiritually. Are you with me? God has given to each of us a measure of faith. He's given us the ability to receive the Spirit or to live influenced by the Spirit. The Spirit then shows up in our lives and says, I got a gift for you. 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 But if we have no idea that the Spirit has gifted us, we then try to live in relationship with God or in fulfillment with God or attempt to please God outside of a giftedness all because we don't understand the grace that's been applied to our lives. Am I making sense? So what, 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 what Paul is saying here, now watch this. He's writing to the church at Rome. He's, I'm going to say it again. He's writing to the church at Rome. Why is that significant? Give me more. He's trying to explain to the church what they should be doing, but give me more. Why the church at Rome? Come on in the house. So he's responding to bureaucratic leadership in the church and saying to the church, no. It's not predicated on bureaucratic appointment. It's based on spiritual giftedness. 
So the effectiveness of the church is not predicated on who we think is important. It's predicated on who has been gifted for the work. Are y'all understanding what I'm teaching? Okay. All right. So we're going, we're going, we're going to, with the time left, any, any questions? Do y'all understand what I just shared with you? Okay. So what we're going to do with the time left is we're going to look at this list, right? We're going to look at this list of motivational gifts that Paul references in this passage. There are seven of them, right? Uh, and don't, don't just know that there are seven, but there are seven referenced, right? But it's non-exhaustive. Are you with me? All right. One of the things, beloved, that has, I mean, torn the body of Christ apart is the arguments we have over spiritual giftedness. And the reason, the fundamental reason that these arguments exist in the body of Christ is because we miss, we, we miscue spiritual gifts as something we possess as opposed to something that God is doing through us. And doing it through us in connection with the mission of God, the Missio Dei, the purpose of God in the earth. It is not about us declaring, I am a prophet. That's a position, right? And in fact, you don't declare yourself a prophet, right? You, you, you are shown to be one by what you do. Y'all are mighty quiet. One of my one of my mentors told me is if you have to announce that you're a preacher, right? The reality is is that so so as you're reading this, remember it's not the gift, it's the what? Gift and ness. Are you with me? Okay, so let's look at this list for the time that we have, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about them. All right, um, First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Let's go there. First Corinthians chapter fourteen. Are y'all are y'all getting this? Uh, making clear? All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul makes a statement here about spiritual gifts, and I want you to see it. Um, he references a specific gift. He says, you there? He says, follow after charity. The word charity there is the word love, right? He says, and desire spiritual gifts. Now, let me park there. Is that not, right, the mantra of Jesus's walk as Lord and Savior? He walked out of love, right? Y'all with me? Which is a gift. We'll, we'll talk about that later, right? So, so, so he's saying model Jesus and desire what? Spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may, what? Prophesy. Now notice he does not say that you may be a prophet. He said that you may prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? Let's move. Prophecy, Khadijah, is, I want to leave no, nobody behind. Prophecy is speaking insight into divine purpose. I'm going to say it again. Speaking insight into divine purpose. Prophecy or the prophetic is to proclaim God's way in the world. The way of peace, the way of justice, the way of forgiveness, the way of reconciliation, radical love, and righteousness. But there, watch this. We have been taught and have heard that to prophesy is this sense of foretelling of the future. But it is not that. It is speaking insight into divine purpose. Does that make sense? You understand that? How many of you prophesy? Okay, you're scared. I didn't know y'all were such wimps. How many of you have ever told somebody how beneficial having Jesus in their lives would be? Oh, oh now you want to raise your hand. 
Have you ever, I, let me tell you something. I, I, I invoke you to prophesy every Sunday. At the end of every service, I tell you something. I said, tell somebody God loves you. Do, do you understand why I am? To proclaim God's way in the world. That's it. Not to tell you that on Friday at 10 o'clock, you're going to have. I know I'm virtual too. Some folk might call me. It's okay. That is not it, it, the divine way. But watch this. You can't speak a way you don't know. We're in a time right now where there are, whole, there are a whole lot of matters of justice that are surfacing, right? There are a whole lot of matters of justice. Certain. We got folk being shot. You know, we, we, we got laws being overturned, right? And the question is, where's the church in all this, right? You got some folk who are fighting for this, some folk who are fighting for that. But the reality is, is what's wrong the church needs to speak out against. What's right the, the church needs to stand up for. But, but I'm going to tell you, most churches are sitting down and most church people are sitting down because we don't know what's right. Right? Because what's right has become what's relative, not what's righteous. Am I making sense? So, so watch this. So then if the Holy Spirit will come into the life of a believer who is sensitive to the Holy Spirit and will impart unto them prophecy, not so that they can go tell everybody, I'm a prophet. No, but so that they can go, what? Speak into divine situations what thus saith the Lord. That's it. Stop making it spooky. It's that simple. Follow after love and do what? He says and do what? Desire spiritual gifts that you may, what? Prophesy. So watch what he's saying. Don't miss this, y'all. He's saying that every spiritual gift has the capacity to give revelation concerning divine purpose. Every spiritual gift whether, has the ability to prophesy. What you saying? No, literally, what you saying? No, for real, what is your life saying? What, am I making sense? Okay. Any questions, any thoughts? You understand that? We ain't talking about no position. We're talking about a giftedness imparted to one who's in right relationship, deep relationship with God, so they can represent the way of God to others because they have what? The spirit's entail at work in their life. Yes. Question. Oh, y'all put the mic back, but that's okay. Purpose. Great question. The question is, is every situation a divine situation? So the word I like to throw out, missio day, mission of God. What is God's mission in the earth? Okay, let me give you a hint. Let me give you a hint. God so loved the world that he gave what? His only begotten son. Now, why was that necessary? That was necessary because the world that God created that he loved was in danger. Talk about, they needed redemption. Now, no, was that who was it? Who was in that redemption? Who was considered in that redemption? Everybody? Everybody. Okay, so since everybody was considered in the redemption, and everybody has not been redeemed, the mission of God is still in existence. So we who are in relationship with God who are gifted still are in the missio day of God. Because remember, 
we don't get the gift for our purposes. We get the gift for his purposes. That's why, watch this, if you've been gifted, right, I often talk about prostituting the gift of God. That's, that's another teaching. Teach but we get this giftedness at having deepened our relationship with God, but then we think more highly of ourselves than we are. So then we go run around using the gift for something that God in, didn't intend. Am I making sense? All because, again, again, all because we shift or we are allowed ourselves to move into a consciousness of the gift makes us something. As opposed to the gift, watch this, y'all. Stay with me. As opposed to the gift being an endowment that edifies. Are you with me? An endowment that edifies. We've been equipped with something. Right? Y'all with me? Let's look at another. How much time I got? Oh, I'm out. Almost. Three minutes? Oh, that's Dougie Fresh. Yeah. Half a Doug. All right. Let's look at First Peter chapter 4 real quick. Are y'all getting, getting this? All right. First Peter chapter 4. All right, serving, serving. I'm going to ask the question in, in, before I deal with this, and I'm going to hope y'all do better than the morning class. Um, yeah, because I'm going to ask this. The morning class struggled with this question. So um, before we get into this, um, who in our church do you all think would, would, would fit the bill of, 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 of what we're getting ready to talk about now, serving? And who, who, who should be endowed with this gift? Anybody? Who should be endowed with the gift of serving? Okay, I'm, I'm here. Somebody raise your hand and, and be the brave one. Yes, sir. Everybody should be endowed with the gift of serving. Okay. Huh? Huh? You, you, you motioning. You look like an air traffic controller right now. What, what you say? Hmm? Part of... What'd you say? I, the deacons. That's what I was looking for. And, and I was waiting for the deacons to say it. One, two, three, four, five. And, 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 and the other deacon filed a six. All right. <laughs> All right. Deacon, diaconate is serving body. Right? Serving body. Now, what we do is, let me, I'm, I'm going to play with this a little bit since we're here. Um, um, what we have the tendency to do is we don't look for the gift before we give the office. Now, the brothers in here who are in the class, we know we've talked about this because one of the things that our DITs are going through right now is the question of if you don't feel called to this, you ain't got no business in it. You've got you there, there, there ought to be a divine impartation that you believe is a part of who you are. And as a result of that, you can do what you need to do. If not, join the choir, be an usher, do, do, do something else, but get off the deacon board. Because as a deacon, you, that, that emphasis, it's not about you being seen. Ooh, y'all better get me. It ain't about you getting to stand in your black and white suit. I asked them what was the criteria for, for a deacon. Somebody said a black suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it's about, beloved. Right? If you don't have the gift of serving, don't you get on the deacon board. Pastor Anthony said it. Write the date, the time down because I meant it. You... Why? Because that's what the calling is all about. Somebody asked me the other day, a friend of mine asked me, I'm do a reading for him. I told him, yes, I'll do the reading for him. And then at the bottom of the communication, I sent back to him, well, you know I can't read, right? Because you are, watch this, and this is what I meant. I did that because oftentimes we ask folk to do things without knowing whether or not they have the gift. Whole, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone, but whole churches have been destroyed because people are out of their giftedness. Let me read this in 1 Peter 4 and 10 and we'll get out of here. All right. Here's what it says. Um, as every, um, y'all with me? As every man has received the gift, even 
and so minister the same one to another. In other words, don't come ministering to me and you ain't got the gift. He says, y'all with me? As good stewards of the manifold what? Grace of God. In other words, you can't just be willy-nilly. You have to be certified and bona fide gifted for the work of God in the kingdom. You go running up to somebody. Oh, God, let me get out of this. A many of people hate God because of ungifted people rendering ministry. Do you understand? They have missed out on Christ. I ain't doing that church thing. Them church people ain't got, they, are they mean? They nasty? They, and most of us are mean and nasty because we're outside of our gift. It doesn't come natural for us. An example of that is looking at the organization of the church and looking at the positions in the church. You, listen, you ain't got no business in the choir if you can't sing. Don't look at me like that. Because y'all know the truth. We Come on in, baby. Come on up there. God knows your heart. Yes, and he knows your voice too. You wouldn't do it at your house. You ain't going to do it with your natural body. You ain't going to have nobody talking about, listen, listen, I got out of school yesterday. I got, I'm a surgeon. <laughs> listen to the text. As good stewards of the manifold what? Grace of God. The manifold favor of God. God says, don't you mess up the favor on your life using a gift that's not yours or trying to do something you're not gifted for. Don't put me in the children's Sunday school class. I'm going to be talking about the charismata of the charis is the ecclesiastical expert. They're going to be like, what, 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 what? Give me Clifford, please. Y'all understand what I'm telling you? In fact, let me say this and I'm going to quit. Learn how to say no if you're not gifted. Learn, no, no, I, I appreciate, I appreciate, but I, no, that's not what I do. I'm not gifted for that. And if you're afraid that you just have to, you know, you're not going to be able to, 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 to be used, remember that it's the gift that makes room. It's the gift that makes room. Y all, y all, y all make, let me read this movie. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject, make, make your subject and your verb agree to serve. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You don't have to know the second theory of thermodynamics and physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. And a soul, here's the word, generated by love. Those are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Right? But it's based in the scripture. You hear what I'm telling you? What you're gifted to do, that's what you do. Right? And we're going to get there. I know some of y'all saying, but how do I find out what my gift is? You keep coming to the class, and when we get to that section, you you <laughs> walk, walk, crawl before you walk. All right. All right. All right. Y'all with me? Y'all understand Go, go, go back and, 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 and read those two passages, those two gifts we've talked about. You can read through the rest of your handout because we're going to walk through the rest of them. This is a long series, y'all. We're just in the early parts of it. We've got two additional lists of gifts that we're going to talk about. There's some more things we're going to reference, including how do I identify what that gift is? We're going to get there. All right. Are there any questions? Yes.
Yeah. So so let me let me let me let me let me let me dig in the question very quickly. Cuz what I what I detect in your in your question is an emphasis on the church organizationally. Right? And so yeah, I understand that, but I want you to know that I only reference the church organizationally to show an example of how it is that we oftentimes mispresent our spiritual giftedness. Now, does, does that make sense? You with me? Kind of sort of, kind of, kind of, kind of, something like that. Okay. All right. So let me, so let me help us. Organizationally, when we attempt to broker to people our inability, in, ineptness, or even undesirable disposition to be a part of any aspect of the organization, it does not change our responsibility to brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So what do I mean by that? I mean, just because I told you no doesn't mean I'm rejecting you or the institution. And you ought to respect the fact that I'm preserving myself not to get engaged into something that's not beneficial for me because it's not going to be beneficial for you either. Right? And then again, you don't get to identify my gift. Does that make sense? All right. When we get to the one of the other lists, and I'll leak this. One of the things that is the a pastor's responsibility, right, is the perfecting of the saint for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, right, I may be shaking his hand. Right, but my ob ultimate objective is identifying his gift and to see how his gift is functioning in the body of Christ and to provide resource to aid him in becoming complete in that giftedness. Right? We ought to function the same way in the natural organization. Don't ask me to do nothing I don't do. Because all you're going to get is a deficient product. Am I making sense? Yeah. Exactly. And she said oftentimes that is what we get because we have, and I don't want to go off into this, y'all, but we have what I call in the church warm body syndrome, right? You know, you know, if you're breathing, right, and you hear enough, we're going to put you in a position, <laughs> right? Right? You know, if you're breathing, you know, uh, what my wife said, except when it comes to food, because we don't want everybody touching our food. <laughs> right. Am I making sense? Yeah. All right. So, I mean, th this is a, what, what's beautiful about this, and I'm going to let you go. What's beautiful about this is that we are, um, we're engaging and beginning to think about the church, right, in, in a more complex and a deeper way. Right. And we're beginning to think about our relationship with God and the relationship he has with us, what he, our ex his expectations of us right, in terms of what he's deposited within us. And that's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. Um, I'll close with a statement I made to Sister Cleveland just a few minutes ago, and the spirit has brought it back to me. I said to her, at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, when I, when I go to bed at night, I can promise you this. I have been to whoever I've encountered that day, my most authentic self, right, my most authentic self. You're going to get me in living color. Why? Because to pretend, right, is to discredit who God has made me. Right? Don't live a lie naturally and don't live a lie spiritually. Learn who you are. Live out of what you, know, what you learn of God and be content with it. Right? That's it. We're grateful and thankful for for, for your presence. We're glad to have with us Deacon Fowler, who is the brother of, of, of Deacon Fowler. And so we're grateful for his presence today. They're hanging out. Um, the Lord heard our prayers. You remember when Israel prayed, right? And they were in bondage under the oppression of Pharaoh. And God sent them Moses to get them out. But I'm praying about Deacon Fowler. And the Lord sent me some help to the, for the next couple of days. <laughs> All right. All right. Listen, um, 
let, let's keep praying um, for Sister Brown's family. Amen. And uh, let's keep praying for one another. Um, this one, this one is going to be a bit tough, right? Um, I know even tougher for some of you, but please believe me, um, tough. There are some things that God has been doing in the spirit realm that I won't share with you all at this service. Her faithfulness and her love, God, for Mount Carmel. In the days to come, God, we ask that you grant comfort and strength to the family and to the friend circle, God, who must come to resolve with the victory that has been won. Thank you, God. We know you won't leave us. And we know that you have received her. Now, God, we lift up to you all of the many members who may be wrestling with circumstances of the flesh, of the mind, the heart, of the soul. We just simply ask that you strengthen and comfort them. We ask, God, that you heal if it is your will. Make whole conditions that are not yet final. God, we ask in faith, knowing that your will is what's best for us, we say nevertheless, not our will, but your will be done. And Father, we stand with our dear sister Marvis right now. God, she spoke of pain in her side and in her shoulder. She spoke of heat running through her her body. God, we ask that you touch her now. Lord, whatever going on that's contrary to how you have constructed her body, we believe you, God, to be able to rectify it right now. God, we call first upon the presence of your power in the circumstance. But God, we also yield to your will and your wisdom through medical science. So God, we are praying as people of faith, but we're asking to God that when she leaves this place, she applies actions to her faith. And we, we ask God that all things be found under the blood and in your will in her life. We know her faith. We, we know she's yours. So now we just simply yield to your manifold power in her life. And we believe it to be wholeness and health. So confirm it, God, if you will, and know that our faith looks up to you. Now, God, there are many in the room and even some who are virtually who, whose requests have not made it to the ears of those of us in the room. But we know that you sit high and you look low. And your, and your word declares that you, you seek to see in whom you may show yourself strong in. So God, we're asking that every weakness, every deficiency, every problem, every challenge that is beyond our ability and beyond our faith, that you, God, move in it and have your way in. So, God, we thank you. We're not going to wait until we hear the reports to celebrate the victory because we recognize that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And we know that we are the righteous, not because we've done right, but because Christ died for us. And he made it possible that we can come before the throne room of grace boldly, ask what we will, believe in faith, and we shall have it. So this is the faith we exercise tonight. We give you glory in advance of reports. For we know you're a good God and you never fail us. Now God, as we prepare to leave this place again, we thank you for the worship experience in the word. We ask that you give us traveling mercies to our respective designations. And when we receive, reach there, Lord God, we let us find things well and kept by your hand. Give us 
sweet rest tonight. Let us rise under the banner of mercy and grace to live another day to your glory, to your honor, and to your praise. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people will say amen. Come on, let's give God praise for victory this house. Be encouraged. Listen, y'all have a blessed and wonderful week. Let us be mindful to pray for one another.